Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfeld. Welcome to Back to the Bible Canada. Delighted to have you join me again. And uh, as you probably know, I'm working my way through the book of Habakkuk. And, you know, if you just join me today, I really encourage you to go back and see what I've done because this will form a series and uh, it's important to, to have heard uh, what's there in the book of Habakkuk until we come to chapter 1, verse 5. And there's a lot that's there. Uh, nonetheless, if you have, um, welcome to this next installment. And I'm going to talk about the surprising work of God. Now, I wonder if you've ever seen a t-shirt, and I saw it years ago, uh, and it simply said, question everything. <laughs> and I remember looking at that, and I was staring at it for some time and thinking, I don't know whether I really like that t-shirt or I really don't like it at all, but I know it's one of the two. And, and let me explain what I mean. You know, it's possible that people that question everything are really using that as an opportunity of challenging everything. It's not really questioning that they're doing. It's they simply won't lay down and accept any authority in their life at all. So questioning everything simply means I'm not listening to anyone. And sometimes we can use it in that fashion. But it's also true that too many of us, I think, go through life without questioning things. Why is it there? If someone says something, why are they saying it? If someone's asking for compliance, are they asking for something that's legitimate? I mean, we all know the story of Nazi Germany that, you know, prior to the coming of the, the Nazis, uh, most of the Germans had a very good relationship with their Jewish neighbors. In fact, uh, they, they were assimilated into one community very effortlessly. And then in a very short period of time, I mean, suddenly the, the culture changes and everyone's now told that the Jews are your enemy. And you now look at your neighbor across the way from you and you view them in a very different way. I mean, why wasn't the ideology of the Nazis questioned in the way it should have been questioned. You see, we should be questioning things more. So again, it just depends on how you take that slogan, question everything. I mean, it can be that we're simply not willing to accept answers, or it could be that we're simply willing to accept anybody who wants to push, to push an ideology onto us. Well, I, I mention all of that because we've been reading Habakkuk, and Habakkuk's been questioning God. Uh, it, it just seems like an audacious thing to do, if you really think about it. But he has been saying, you know, how long, O oh Lord, will I cry violence? And it seems like, at least from my view of it, there's so much injustice that's going on in Jerusalem, and you seem to be doing nothing about that. And, and so, you know, why do you make me look on wrong is what he says. And so let's now, uh, from the book of Habakkuk, listen to God's answer. And it's so important. If we're going to ask God questions, we've got to be prepared if God gives answers that we're ready to listen. And so today, it's important for us not to simply ask the question, why is there evil in the world? Uh, why is so much harm being done? Why do unjust rulers come to power and seemingly reign so long? I mean, how can that be? Some of us think by simply asking the question, we've done away with the idea of God. It's because we're not used to listening to answers. And so that's what we're doing today. We're listening to God's answer. So with Bible in hand, I've, I've got uh, the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verses 5 to 11. God's answer. Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves, their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. <laughs> Wow, that's quite an answer. Now, if you didn't get it, uh, we're going to take some time and try to work our way through that. But that's God's answer. Now, Habakkuk's asked a question, hasn't he? 
God, why don't you do something? And now God has answered. So God says, I've not been idle. I know that Habakkuk did the audacious thing and said, why do you idly look on? It's quite a thing to say because there was an assumption in that. God was not idly looking on and Habakkuk clearly misunderstood what was going on. But here comes the answer. See, God says, Habakkuk, you're going to have to look more carefully. Look again at verse 5, and it says, Look among the nations, says God, wonder and be astounded. See, uh, there's something that Habakkuk really should have grasped. And remember, if you watch through this series, that you've been told that Habakkuk most likely was what we call a temple prophet. And as a temple prophet, you have to believe that he had access to what the previous prophets before his time had to say about all sorts of things. We know that prophets frequently condemned evil in Israel, but we also know that the prophets had a great deal to say about the nations around Israel and the nations of all the earth. Because the God of Israel was not a tribal deity that God of Israel was the one God who controlled everything in heaven and on earth, and all the nations, as Isaiah said, are regarded as nothing before him. So, you know, Habakkuk should have remembered that. So while he's busy looking at the injustice in Jerusalem, he should have raised his eyes just a little bit and said, what else is God doing? And he hadn't been doing that. So God says, look among the nations, look up, See what I'm doing in the nations around you. So, so Habakkuk's called upon to look at the world. And by the way, um, I think there's a lesson in that for us. I mean, we live in a day when I think access to global information is more readily available than ever before. And we're more aware of what happens nationwide. And I know for myself, when I often speak to Christians about what's happening in terms of the persecution of believers around the world, I get a lot of believers to look at me and say, I I had no idea anything was going on. Um, So uh, it's very important for us to begin to get a wider perspective of what God is doing. So God is answering, and so uh, let's look again. So he says, look at the nations, wonder, then halfway through verse 5, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. So I'm going to tell you, and you're going to struggle with this, and we find out that, in fact, is exactly what happened. I mean, Habakkuk had a great deal of difficulty with what God was telling him, but he needed to listen nonetheless. So here's the first thing that God is doing. For behold, that's in verse 6, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans, that's another word for the Babylonians. So I'm raising up the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation. Well, no, if you know your Bible well, you should know that a huge chunk of our Bible is taken up in the Babylonian problem. I say it's a huge chunk of our Bible because you can go all the way back to the book of Genesis and you hear in Genesis chapter 11 of a tower that was built in a place called Babel. And that's the the foundations of Babylon. But then we don't hear about it again until much later. And then, and listen to this, the end of 2 Kings is all about the rise of Babylon. The end of 2 Chronicles is all about the rise of Babylon. Great parts of Isaiah has to do with Babylon. All of the book of Jeremiah, that is all 52 chapters of that very long book, is taken up with Babylon. All of the book of Lamentations is taken up with Babylon. All of the book of Daniel is taken up with Babylon. All of the book of Ezekiel, 48 chapters, is taken up with the issue of Israel in Babylon. The book of Obadiah was probably written in that time, as well as the books of Nahum, Zephaniah, and of course Habakkuk. So there we have it. A big hunk of the Old Testament deals with this one issue and this one issue alone. And then by the time you get to the end of the book of Revelation, you'll hear again this lament that goes on for two chapters about Babylon. So if you don't know a lot about Babylon, uh, I'm going to say that you're missing a big chunk of the drama of the Bible itself. So uh, let me read to you from Psalm 137. It begins in this way. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. 
That is when we remember Jerusalem. So that psalm was written when Babylon had already destroyed the city of Jerusalem, burned the temple to the ground, taken a great host of the Jewish people and transported them to Babylon. And they sat beside the rivers of Babylon and they were weeping. And the tormentors uh, of the Jews were coming to them and saying, hey, why don't you sing us one of them songs about Zion? It was a joke among them. And then everyone would have laughed. And the psalmist says, how can I sing the Lord's song in this strange land? Yeah, it seems like everything that we had been promised in the Bible was lost when Babylon, this great seemingly satanic army came and utterly destroyed us and took away our inheritance. See, that's the drama that we find in Babylon. Now, in Habakkuk's day, that drama was just barely beginning. That's why God is saying, I mean, you look up now, you think I'm doing nothing, have a look. I'm raising up the Chaldeans, I'm raising up the Babylonians. I mean, Babylon would soon become the Middle East power and nation after nation would fall and Babylon would kind of eclipse the horizon, but it wasn't that way yet. That is when Habakkuk was speaking. Uh, but, But there it was going to be in the future. And even though it was still in the future, I'm going to argue Habakkuk should not have been surprised uh, because had he looked at the previous prophets, he would have seen that the the great empire before the Babylonians was the Assyrian Empire. And, And let me tell you a little bit about the Assyrian Empire. Had Habakkuk looked back at Isaiah chapter 10 verse 5, he would have found this, this line, Ah, Assyria, the rod of my anger. The staff in their hands is my fury. Think about what that that line just said. You know, as the Assyrian Empire was, you know, gaining ground and taking over nation after nation, God was saying, I'm using Assyria as my tool to punish the nations for their wickedness. Wow. They are the rod of my anger. They think they're doing it. Actually, I'm simply using them to do it. And then if you read Zephaniah 2, verse 13, it says, and he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria. And he will make Nineveh, which was the capital of Assyria, a desolation, a dry waste like the desert. In other words, God is going to use the Assyrian empire until it has, until God has accomplished what he was going to do in that, you know, through that nation. And then God would dispose of that nation at will. See, that's, that's a mentality that should have been settled in Habakkuk. God moves the nations at will, and now he's telling the prophet, have a look, I'm raising up the Babylonians. So let me share where Babylon was at at the time of Habakkuk. Um, they had, at the time of Habakkuk, already gained independence from the Assyrian Empire, and then war was on the way. The Assyrians were going to lash back and eventually Babylon would win that war and they would completely destroy Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, and reduce Assyria to ruins. Well then, then comes 605 BC and this would be the very famous battle of Carchemish when the Egyptians decided they didn't like the new Babylonian empire and so they marched an army against the Babylonians and the Babylonians crushed them. Um, And then that would end Egyptian greatness and all Egyptian attempts to regain an empire from then on till the present day. Egypt has never been an empire again after the Babylonians destroyed them at Carchemish. So you can get a sense, when Babylon finishes with a nation, they've humbled them and reduced them to nothing. See, that's the bad news. Indeed, about 20 years after Habakkuk was written, um, about 586 BC, uh, the Babylonians would come to the gates of Jerusalem and uh, they would tear down the wall of Jerusalem and they would enter in and they would wantonly slaughter the citizens of Jerusalem. And if you want a a description of that, you're going to have to read the book of Lamentations. It's a song of lament that that was put together by Jeremiah where he laments the destruction of his people. So these were traumatic times that were coming up. So notice what God has already told Habakkuk. He says, the nation of Babylon that I'm raising up is a bitter nation, meaning that You know, when anyone slights the Babylonians, they'll never forget. Their anger will burn against anyone who tries anything against them. Bitterness is in the Babylonian mindset. 
And then also, Habakkuk is told the nation is hasty, meaning they don't wait a long time before they punish their adversaries. They get going immediately. And then Habakkuk is also told that this nation seizes dwellings not their own. That is, it's nothing to them to go and take over something that doesn't belong to them. In fact, they pride themselves in all that kind of stuff. So the question is, God, what are you doing? And here's God's initial answer. Look, Habakkuk, I'm doing something about the evil that's happening in Jerusalem. That's been your problem, hasn't it? Lord, how can you look on while there is so much violence in Jerusalem, while the law of God is being trampled on, the poor are being abused, I mean, the rich are simply taking advantage, and nobody seeks the God of Israel anymore. How can you simply idly look on this kind of an evil thing that's being done in Jerusalem and you're doing nothing? And God's answer is, oh, maybe you better look up because I am doing something. I've been very busy. I've been raising up one of the most fiercest empires that the world has ever seen, And in a very short period of time, they're going to be at your door as the rod of my punishment to punish you for the evil that's going on. (laughs) Now you get the drama of God's answer. So so God has described Babylon. You know, Habakkuk 1, 6 6 says they're bitter and hasty, utterly ruthless. You know, if you want an example of how ruthless they were, uh, the king that was king in Jerusalem Um, at the time when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem, was a man by the name of Zedekiah. When the Babylonians finally were breaking through the wall, the king and his nobility decided they'd make a run for it. They got on their horses and chariots and just went as fast as they could go, hoping to escape the Babylonian army. Well, the Babylonians caught up to Zedekiah, and they captured him and brought him before the king of Babylon. And then in the presence of of the king of Babylon, Zedekiah watched as his sons were all slaughtered in his presence. And then immediately after that, they gouged out Zedekiah's eyes so that the last sight he ever saw in this world was the slaughter of his own sons. That gives you a sense of how bitter and how cruel that nation actually was going to be. It was an extremely aggressive nation. Uh, Verse seven says, they were dreaded and fearsome. They would strike terror into the heart of anyone who thought of them. Verse 8 said they would strike quickly. In fact, um, historians tell us that they were the most efficient army that the Middle East had seen up to that point in time. They had developed a military machine that nobody knew how to defend themselves against. I mean, everyone watched with slack-jawed amazement as they were coming. Nobody had the capacity to stop them. Verse 9 says, their fa- they came with their faces forward, it says. It was always a frontal attack. They didn't win by stealth. They were quite fine if you saw them coming. After all, what are you going to do about them in the first place? And verse 10 says, they have contempt for their enemies. They scoff at kings. You know, um, if you have a walled fortress to prevent them from coming in, they simply built a ramp and the ramp was as high as the wall, and then they simply took the wall of your city where you would have defenders standing. They'd kill all the defenders. Then the Babylonians would be standing on the wall, and they'd be shooting down in the city. In essence, your city became a cooking pot in which everyone was cooked on the inside. That's how the Babylonians functioned. See, that's the contempt they had for their enemies. And verse 11 says that they destroy nation after nation, and they never think about them again. That is, as soon as they've destroyed a nation, they just lose it from their imagination. It doesn't mean a thing to them. Now, that's God's answer. You think I'm doing nothing? No, no, I'm going to punish the evil in Jerusalem by raising up a nation just like that. Now, I know when we hear that, immediately we're going to say again, is God then the author of evil? Uh, Because this seems to be a very evil nation, and is God the one who actually does evil? And the answer is, God is never the author of moral evil. However, God could have at any moment in time stopped the Babylonians in his in their tracks, but he chose not to. He chose for the sake of his wrath, for the sake of punishment of wickedness, not just the wickedness of Jerusalem, but all of the other nations around. God was going to end the wickedness that was there. 
So what do we learn? Well, first point, we learn that wickedness will never succeed. God will, in due season, absolutely destroy wickedness. That's what Habakkuk has to know. God's not going to allow the godlessness in Jerusalem to carry on. See, it's a lesson for all of us to know. I mean, you know, many of us will look at, you know, our own sin, our own wickedness, and we'll say, how? You'll look around and say, God doesn't seem to be doing anything about it, so I must be fine. Don't be so sure about that. God has prepared a day, and He rules all things well. Let me read to you from Genesis 15, 13 to 16. And uh, please remember, um, God is promising Abraham that his descendants will take over the promised land, which is Canaan. But listen to what the promise says. Genesis 15, 13 to 16, Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation they serve, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall buried, you shall be buried in a good old age, and they, that is your descendants, shall come back here in the fourth generation. Why? Why so long before Israel is given the right to take over the promised land? And here's the answer. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. That is, God will allow evil to continue on till a certain point in time. Now, I don't know when that point is, when, you know, evil is filled up to the top of the glass. But when it gets there, that's when God says judgment will fall. Now, we don't actually know when that place is, so uh, we, we, we should take note from that. I mean, if, if you're involved in repeated habitual sin that you will not repent of, let me say this to you. If you have not seen the judgment of God at this point in time, You need to take this very seriously. God is giving you time and room to repent. Take the time now. You don't know when his patience will wear thin. That's the thing that we need to remember. That's what Habakkuk came to realize about all the violence that he had seen. You see, God is a compassionate God. He does not willingly or with great pleasure afflict the sons of men, as the Bible says. He takes no delight. He's not rubbing his hands in glee at the thought, this is when I punish the wicked. In fact, he gives room and time. He sends prophets. He sends a word. He says, come to your senses. He says, learn from what has happened in the past and for the judgments that I've done in the past. Learn from them. Take them to heart and say to yourself, if God treated Jerusalem this way for their sins, I won't be able to get out from it either. So that's what we need to learn from all of this. I love what Bruce Waltke said, and he may not have been the first one to say it, but he said, the wheels of God's justice move ever so slowly. And some of us complain about that. Why do the wheels of justice move ever so slowly? But they, that is the wheels of God's justice, grind so exceedingly fine. Oh, yes. When God's justice is done, it will be done thoroughly and completely. So don't be so quick to say, God, why aren't you doing something about that evil over there when you don't look at your own life and say, you know, God, why aren't you doing something about the evil that I am perpetrating in my own life? And here's the second conclusion that we come. Um, We also know that God rules over all things. And he does rule over evil. In the end, evil will submit to God. So I'm going to say, here's uh, five things that we need to remember about this. One, God permits evil. Yes, he does. Acts 14, 16. In the past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. That is, he does have an allowance. He gives room, not because God is lenient, but because God is merciful. Judgment will come and God will call us to account for every evil deed that we have done. When his justice comes, we need to recognize that at that point in time, the time for repentance is over. So take the opportunity now. God permits evil for a period of time. Secondly, God punishes evil sometimes with evil, with other evil. And that's what Habakkuk and many other prophets had to say in the Old Testament. Look at Psalm 
81 verses 11 to 12. It says, but my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. I gave them over, God says. I stopped restraining them. I could have restrained them further. I said, if they can continue to insist on evil, I'm just going to stop. Or, or you might think about Romans 1. God gave them over to a depraved mind. God says, all right, I'm going to release you into depravity. See, God punishes us by releasing us into greater depravity than we might have even considered in the past. See, God will use evil to punish evil. Thirdly, God brings good out of evil. I mean, that's the lesson that we should learn from the story of Joseph. Joseph said to his brothers, you intended it for evil, God intended it for good. And if you know the story of Joseph, you'll know exactly how that played itself out. God did a beautiful and glorious thing because of an evil thing that had been done. And we need to look no further than the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the story of unbridled evil and yet the story of the great mercy of God. Number four, God uses evil both to test and to discipline the ones that he loves. Oh, this is an important thing to say. Hebrews 12 teaches us, and I'm going to leave that for my next session, but it, but it does teach us that God will use evil for its own purposes, and, and, uh, and so also we'll, we will be disciplined by it. It was Martin Luther who once said that Satan is none other than the unwilling servant of God. So Satan rages against God and seeks to do as much evil against God's purposes. But in the end of the day, Satan will always play into God's hands. Luther liked to say he's still God's devil. He doesn't mean that God has a dark side to him. But he simply says that the devil will not defeat God, but that he will play into God's hands. It is also the case with all evil that is done. And that's the Babylonian Empire, a a very evil empire. And God says, if Jerusalem insists on throwing my law behind their backs, then know this, over there across the horizon, right now I'm raising up the fiercest empire the Middle East has ever seen. And they're going to be at your door and they're going to lay this door in waste. And indeed, they will be the rod of my anger to punish Jerusalem for their wickedness. Now, I I wanted to say another thing about the role that evil plays in God's purposes. One day, as we know, God will redeem his people from all evil and he will destroy the throne of Satan entirely. You see, and here's really the the story of the, of the, uh, the downfall of Jerusalem. The downfall of Jerusalem is supposed to be an example that's for all of us, that in the end of the day, when wickedness continues to be done, wickedness has a day of justice and God will bring it about. So we've been making some conclusions about what Habakkuk has been told. We've noticed that God rules over everything and that means he also rules over evil. But we must never forget that God is not evil. In him is light, says the Bible. In him there is no darkness at all. But we must also remember that God is overwhelmingly loving and gracious, giving us time to repent. But please don't assume that God's love and graciousness, his mercy, his forbearance, his kindness, his patience, all of these things, please don't think that means that God is tolerant of evil. Rather, God is just and his justice will be perfectly meted out. You know, in the end of the day, uh, when we come to the book of Revelation, chapter 18, verse 2, there is a marvelous line that we need to memorize. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Fallen never to rise again. That indeed is coming. All evil will utterly be put to waste in the end of the day. And so God's answer to a prophet who came to him and said, You know, how come you allow evil to be there? The answer would have been, I'm giving you time to repent, but if you don't, I am moving all of history already, and history is going to be moved towards this pinnacle point in time when the Babylonians will be at your door. Now, if you know the book of uh, Habakkuk, you'll know, and I'm going to get a little bit ahead and talk about what I'm going to say next week, but uh, in Habakkuk, 
he finally has a second complaint. Um, He says, oh God, I hadn't assumed that this is what you're doing and I don't know whether I can handle this. The information that you're giving is far greater than I can ever imagine. And you and I need to remember that the question of why evil is permitted to exist for a moment is not an academic question meant for classrooms. It ultimately is meant for the drama of human history and the drama of all of our lives. See, I am deeply comforted in this fact that God loved the world so much that even though this world deserves judgment and and deserves only the wrath of God, but that God has sent His Son into the world. God loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish, would not perish in the judgment, would not fall under the righteous anger of God, but turn to Christ and to live. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever would believe in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But then we find out that if we will not believe, we already are condemned because God's judgment is coming. So I want to encourage you in all of this to, first of all, allow some of these answers to penetrate. I mean, evil will have its day. God's justice will grind exceedingly fine. And at the same time, the God who loves us is also giving us time to repent and turn to Him and receive mercy at His hands. For Christ, our sacrificial lamb, suffered on our behalf so that the suffering for our own evil would not fall upon us, but fall upon Him who loved us. See, that's the good news of the gospel. And if you don't know Christ today, here's the word I want to say to you. Come to Him and be saved. You need to be saved from your own wickedness lest wrath fall upon you in due season. You need a Savior. And by God's grace, there is a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hey, have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining me today. God bless you. Thank you for watching today. And I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, Thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.